Hello everyone, my name is Joseph Kent. I'm the Director of Education for the National Atomic Testing Museum. And on behalf of the museum staff and the Nevada Tesla Historical Foundation, I would like to welcome you all to today's distinguished lecture featuring Angela M. Sheffield. During her presentation, Ms. Sheffield will discuss the science and science fiction of AI and highlight research at the DOE National Labs and across the nuclear proliferation community, non-proliferation community to develop AI power technologies to transform nuclear non-proliferation detection. Ms. Sheffield will be answering audience questions following the event, so if you do have a question for her, please hold it until the end, and if you're watching remotely, please put it in the Zoom chat box. Please, um, and we are honored to be hosting Ms. Sheffield here at the National Atomic Testing Museum, and it's now my pleasure to introduce her. Angel M. Sheffield is a graduate student at the Eisenhower School for National Security and Resource Strategy at the National Defense University. Her research focuses on the strategic implications of advanced and emerging technologies to inform national strategy to ensure U.S. security and technological interests in long-term competition. Ms. Sheffield is on detail to NDU from the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, where she serves as a senior program manager for data science and artificial intelligence. At the Office of Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation Research and Development within the U.S. Department of Energy, National Nuclear Security Administration. An internationally recognized expert in nuclear nonproliferation and AI, Ms. Sheffield leads the U.S. government's premier program to develop the next generation of AI to transform national security and fulfill mission requirements across the U.S. government to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. Prior to joining DOE, Ms. Sheffield worked as a scientist at DOE's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, or PNNL where she led project teams to develop predictive modeling and analytics methodologies to reduce the threat of terrorism and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Ms. Sheffield has dedicated her career to driving science and technology innovations to address the toughest challenges of national security. She joined PNNL after a distinguished career as an active duty officer in the U.S. Air Force, where she specialized in research and development of technical intelligence of U.S. and adversary weapon systems. Ms. Sheffield holds a BS in economics from the United States Air Force Academy, an MS in operations research from Kansas State University, and is completing an MS in national security and resource strategy from the National Defense University. Please join me in welcoming the esteemed Angela M. Sheffield. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Alex, who's back there on slides, and thank you so much for joining us today for this presentation on AI and nuclear proliferation detection. Next slide, please. So I'm staying here in Las Vegas, obviously, and this morning, so I ordered some breakfast, DoorDash, and I got a call from the front desk at my hotel, and they said, your DoorDash is here. I said, thank you, and they said, we have a robot. I said, you have a robot? They said, you ha we have a robot, and the robot will bring you your breakfast. And I wanted to say, I work in artificial intelligence. Is that why you have a robot? But I thought it was incredible that a robot brought me my breakfast this morning. Because, I mean, that's what we expect of the future. And similarly with artificial intelligence, the future is now. And we can wait no longer to leverage emerging capabilities like artificial intelligence to transform the way we achieve our national security objectives. Next slide, please. <clears throat> U.S. strategies to deter state and non-state actors from pursuing new program programs to develop nuclear weapons have long focused on detecting and controlling special nuclear material. However, this approach supports strategies to deter an actor only after their program has progressed to the late and high stakes stages of nuclear material production and nuclear weapons testing. History has shown us that deterrence at this stage of, of program development is too late to be successful. However, new techniques that leverage big data and artificial intelligence aim to detect earlier warnings of an emerging nuclear weapons program by characterizing the weapons usable capability of advances in civilian dual use and weapons related nuclear science and technology and by detecting subtle changes in intent from civilian to military use. This may enable intervention when a program first diverges from peaceful purposes and when deterrence is more likely to be successful. Next slide, please. 
Nuclear nonproliferation and arms control have been central to U.S. national security strategy and approaches to ensure strategic stability around the globe since the dawn of the nuclear age. And in fact, immediately after World War II, the United States government called for the development of technologies and science-enabled solutions to detect and monitor for the development, for the development of capabilities to, for, to uh, have nuclear weapons and for nuclear testing around the globe. And the research to develop those capabilities started right here in Nevada at the National Nuclear Security Site and leveraging the capabilities of what would become the Department of Energy's nu excuse me, the Department of Energy's National Laboratory Complex. Next slide. Existing U.S. strategy to deter nuclear weapons development, again, focuses on denying access to special nuclear material. This approach relies on the use of technologies and science-enabled strategies to detect nuclear material and whether the uh, interdicted nuclear material is intended for peaceful use or military applications. For example, within the Department of Energy's Nuclear Smuggling Detection and Deterrence Program, the United States works with international partners to integrate radiation detectors at border crossings around the world to detect and disrupt the smuggling of illicit nuclear material. Additionally, technologies developed by the United States are incorporated into the International Atomic Energy Agency's programs to monitor for misuse of nuclear facilities and the diversion of nuclear material. In, a, in addition to denying illicit actors access to nuclear material, these programs deter states from nuclear weapons development by increasing the cost of illicit use and by threatening severe punishments, such as economic sanctions levies against Iran following their noncompliance with the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty in 2008. Next slide. However, there are two fundamental limitations to this material-focused strategy. First, mastery of the uranium enrichment process, which marks a program's capability to produce special nuclear material or nuclear material for peaceful use, occurs near the middle of a program's development, which can occur years or decades into a nuclear weapons program's development. Technologies to detect nuclear material and its production reveal emerging programs only after they possess this capability. Second, Traditional technologies only detect nuclear proliferation activities related to nuclear material, and they are blind to other key activities, such as the research, development, or acquisition of the special equipment, technologies, and expertise it takes to build a nuclear weapon. These activities may be observable far earlier in the development of an emerging program and long before the production of material for nuclear weapons. Recent history has shown that, in fact, this approach is too limited to secure the United States' vital interests. For example, after breakout by North Korea, the United States had too few policy options for deterrence and intervention. Indeed, for nuclear weapons programs that advance to this stage, the stage of nuclear material production or nuclear weapons testing, the level of motivation and the perceived benefit from having nuclear weapons may be so great that is, that is impossible to deter them from their efforts. Further, further, all of this and yet still further, it is, unlikely that, it is likely that any new nuclear weapons program will leverage dual use research and nuclear science and technology to clandestinely advance their capabilities. This, re this regime of activities, looking at dual use activities, is not addressed by traditional proliferation detection capabilities. This means that we desperately need a new approach. Next slide. In this slide, I depict our traditional nuclear proliferation detection capability in green. And you can see I've kind of notionally used a Y and an X axis here to describe the range of illicit activities we expect to see from a bad actor in their pursuit of nuclear weapons. And across the X axis here, I think this is a little bit more interesting we have the, um, the progress of the nuclear fuel cycle, but I want to note here time. So here depicted by the green circle is our coverage both in the sort of range of activities we expect to be able to detect with our capabilities and the time in nuclear program development that we're covering. And here, U.S. capability is in green and the threat space is in yellow. 
And this kind of depicts the traditional approach and also based on our traditional assessment of nuclear proliferation activities. And historically, up and you know, kind of since the dawn of the nuclear age type historically, we've had a decent ratio, ratio of coverage between US capabilities and the threat space. Next slide, please. But today, as I mentioned, we're in a different strategic environment with a different threat space in which we expect to see a greater range of activities, particularly in the space towards early proliferation. Um, you know, this change from, from leveraging dual use capabilities, et cetera. And in this case, we can clearly see, you know, the ratio of coverage we have between our traditional capabilities that's no longer sufficient to cover the threat space. Next slide, please. So again, we need to adopt an approach that in addition to our focus, in addition to our focus on the production of special nuclear material, adds in a focus of early proliferation detection. For example, the development of capabilities to detect changes in the weapons usable capability of an emerging program and to reveal subtle indicators and changes of strategic intent from peaceful to military use. This will demand the development of new strategies and also new technologies to do it. Enter artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. So what is artificial intelligence? Put simply, if one can put artificial intelligence simply, AI is a technology system that is designed to perceive, reason, infer, decide, act, and adapt to achieve the best outcome. And the point that I want to make here is that what differentiates artificial intelligence from traditional computational modeling capabilities or data analytics approaches is that achieving a best outcome approach. What we uh, try to accomplish when we develop artificial intelligence is dis to design in the ability for the technology system to identify alternatives and choose some best outcome from those alternatives. That's the differentiating feature with artificial intelligence. And to make an AI requires three components, data, algorithms, and compute. Those three pieces together make up artificial intelligence. And if you've heard anything about artificial intelligence, you've probably heard that AI takes a ton of data. And there is an important message in that, but I want to re-articulate something that I think is um, another really important aspect to understand about artificial intelligence, which is, so AI, we're talking about a computer program that exists as a digital entity. Sometimes we even use the word agent. But because it's existing digitally, it somehow has to operate with the world in, the, in, the way, in a way that is represented digitally. And data creates a digital representation of the physical world in which the artificial intelligence operates. So data is all about creating a, a representative image or representative element of the world, rep representation of the world in a way that the computer program can interact with. So everything that, that the computer program sees about the world is in that data. So that is the important element of data, that it is creating a computational representation of the physical world, and that creates the world for the artificial intelligence. <clears throat> Now certainly research in artificial intelligence and even specific algorithms like machine learning has been going on for decades. But there absolutely is a revolution today in artificial intelligence and what we can do with it. And that is because of the simultaneous and reinforcing advances in these three things, data, algorithms, and compute. So I think we're all kind of in our experience understand that the data is a completely different thing today than it was even 10 years ago. Traditionally, we've thought of data as you know, numbers in a spreadsheet, but today we see data everywhere and the opportunity to collect data everywhere. So we're talking about entirely new volumes of data. We think of different things than we ever have as data. We've never historically thought of images as data or thought of interacting with text in a way that you could analyze like data. It's an entirely new concept and it's a new expectation for humans kind of in every sector, in science, in medicine, in national security, this new concept of data. Now this new availability and demand for data and to be able to use data to inform decision making has driven advances in algorithms. 
and those advanced algorithms are particularly tailored for those new data types. So we have incredibly powerful algorithms now that allow us to pull information out of text, information out of images. These are unstructured globs of computational information that without these algorithms, we wouldn't have a, the opportunity to interact with in a way that we can analyze. But again, those changes in data have driven some changes in algorithms. This is only made possible by a really transformational thing that has happened in the last decade or so in computing. So historically, if something like supercomputing was a capability made only available to nation states. But today, with distributed computing and cloud-based computing, the power of supercomputers, the power that uh, we within the Department of Energy National Laboratory Complex have in our world-class high-performance computers, is made available to me, to you, to graduate students, to high school students, you know, everyone has the power of supercomputers at their fingertips, leveraging distributed and cloud-based computing capabilities. And that just has, that means something entirely different for the way we discover, uh, kind of pursue science and research and development, and together has created this revolution in artificial intelligence that enables us to do things truly differently than we ever have before, and that creates an offset for nuclear proliferation detection. Next slide, please. But all that said, and I was uh, kind of smiling with someone even before this presentation, AI is not magic, and it doesn't do anything for us automatically. To build a smart artificial intelligence powered system that helps us detect nuclear proliferation detection still requires that we are very smart about nuclear proliferation because we have to get all of that smarts into the computational system to help us detect nuclear proliferation. So to leverage artificial intelligence for nuclear proliferation detection or for any national security mission, we have to draw on our long-standing expertise in nuclear science and technology and the threat space expertise resident within the Department of Energy National Laboratory Complex and within partnerships in academia and in industry. But because of things like these new data sources, and the ability to pull information from them with technology, we have the opportunity to look for new signatures of proliferation, things that we've never either been able to see before or have never leveraged to, to our advantage in the nuclear proliferation detection space. So advances in data combined with these new algorithms have the promise, and I'll show you in some examples, the opportunity to discover new signatures, particularly in that regime of early proliferation detection of which we've had no coverage before in terms of technology. We can also leverage artificial intelligence, these algorithms that we've been talking about, apply them to our existing, tradi our traditional nuclear proliferation detection capabilities. So add them um, to the traditional data sources and technologies that we've used to deepen our capability in those spaces, and perhaps also to fuse data from multiple sources of sensors to lower sensitivity and reveal new information that we've not ever seen before. This is particularly relevant as we need uh, advanced capability to characterize even existing proliferation threats. Further, and this is something that I get very excited about, we as humans can use artificial intelligence to just do things we've never done before. And in the case of nuclear proliferation detection, to accelerate our innovation, enable us to do scientific discovery more effectively or even differently than we have before, and um, accelerate our ability to develop, to develop and evaluate technologies that we can use for nuclear proliferation detection. Next slide, please. So I'll re-familiarize us with this chart depicting our capabilities in nuclear proliferation detection in green and the expanded threat space in yellow. Again, with our traditional capabilities, we leave a lot of the threat space uncovered. Next slide, please. But when we cross-cut that with artificial intelligence, next slide, we both expand and enhance our ability to detect illicit activities to develop nuclear weapons around the globe. This will enable us to detect emerging nuclear weapons threats far earlier than has ever been possible before, and also to reveal new insights about existing nuclear programs, such as Russia and China. Early proliferation detection methods may provide policy and decision makers with essential, timely information to develop, to develop deterrent strategies for a wider range of nuclear proliferation activities. 
And further, they will enable the United States to deter programs at earlier stages of development when the stakes are lower because success is still uncertain and there is limited investment in purely weapons usable capabilities. At that point, early in the development of a nuclear weapons program and before, as we have seen historically, public declaration of malintent by withdrawing from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and long before the celebration of a successful nuclear weapons test, it may yet be possible to devise strategies to, defer, to deter further advances in capability. So I'll talk now about a couple examples of what we're talking about here with artificial intelligence to enhance and expand nuclear proliferation detection. Next slide, please. So in the first example, there's research at the National Laboratories now to expand our ability to characterize the, sophisticating of ex the sophistication of existing nuclear weapons programs, particularly nuclear weapons tests. There's research to develop predictive modeling techniques that leverage data collected here at the National Nuclear Security site and combine it with predictive models based again on our expertise in nuclear um, science and technology to enhance our ability to characterize nuclear weapons tests abroad. Additionally, as we talked about new, new ways to detect nuclear proliferation in different data sources that move us left of boom or earlier in the progress of a nuclear weapons program. There's also research to develop AI-powered methods to track the progress of scientists engaging in nuclear weapons research around the globe. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier that we are optimistic about the use of new algorithms to develop capabilities to fuse data from multiple sensors that enhance our ability to characterize, uh, to reveal new information, particularly um, in the data that we're collecting. For example, fusing sensor data to improve reactor monitoring and safeguards. And finally, and for those who are familiar with the capabilities of the Department of Energy National Laboratories, the term test beds will be familiar to you. This is the use of domestic facilities and user, domestic sites and user facilities here within the United States to emulate what we expect to see in the threat space and to do research and technology development there that we expect to apply to threats abroad. That traditionally has been a very heavy infrastructure investment and is limited by what we're able to create in that physical site. We're now developing techniques leveraging data and advances in modeling and concepts like digital twins to extend this testbed concept to include both physical and virtual testbeds in which we can create synthetic representations of these physical um, testbed facilities that expand our ability to use them for research and technology development. Next slide, please. Today, the United States faces strategic competition with, uh, excuse me, the United States faces strategic competition with an emergent China and a resurgent Russia, who are making strategic national investments in a number of different technologies, including artificial intelligence, which they hope will help them achieve both economic and military advantage relative to the United States. In this era of strategic competition, the nation asks more of its science and technology enterprise than it ever has. And to, to address these demands, we have to leverage artificial intelligence to transform discovery, augment reasoning, and enable better decision making. In fact, our national decision makers and senior policymakers are already writing artificial intelligence into national strategy. For example, Recent discussions by Secretary Austin, the Secretary of Defense, around the future of strategic deterrence, which moves us from beyond just nuclear deterrence to an integrated sort of deterrence, relies on artificial intelligence. And also, our strategy for climate change. Artificial intelligence is essential to our success there. But I'm going to tell you a secret. The sort of artificial intelligence that we need to address these critical challenges of science and security does not quite exist yet. The sort of artificial intelligence we need to apply to the missions of science and security is advanced, is sophisticated, is really, really hard to build. The missions of nuclear proliferation detection, like the missions in science and security, demand the development of advanced techniques and approaches to artificial intelligence. And in developing artificial intelligence to transform nuclear proliferation detection, we are building the future of artificial intelligence, the future of AI that it will take 
to address the most critical challenges of our era. And with that, I will take any of your questions. Next slide, please, Alex. Yeah, and uh, I appreciate you recognizing I can't talk too much about specific data sources, but I will say that there are approaches that we, as a community, have long, there are areas like as you described where we, as a community, have long expected there to be indicators of interesting activity, but we've never before had technologies to go after them. Artificial intelligence does give us new tools to look for those indicators, indicators that traditionally have been developed often over years, but manually by hand by a highly trained intelligence analyst to find those, sources, those sorts of indicators automatically in data, which does not at all replace the important job of something like an intelligence analyst, but it enables us to discover those indicators automatically and at scale in a way that we never have before. And in that greater scale of indicators, so first of all, that achieves some sort of broad area ability to look for that automatically at a scale that we've not been able to before. And then across many indicators, look for new features that might indicate the emergence of a nuclear weapons program. So we absolutely do look to those sorts of hypotheses as not just inspiration, but as a starting point for the use of artificial intelligence in this space, um, and have successfully accomplished that with the use of automated tools. And I think that opens up an entirely new realm of the sorts of things that we'll want to look for as well. So yes, yeah, and then also yes and. Yeah. With intelligence, there's always counterintelligence. So what are our enemies doing to counter our attempts to understand what they're doing? Do you know anything about that? Can you talk about that? So to your first question, I'll kind of return to what I ended with, with which is certainly the nation is asking more of its enterprise than it ever has before. And I walked through academically some explanation as to how that requires, uh, why that requires a different approach and also how advances in technologies like artificial intelligence empower us to take that different approach. So I certainly, not speaking at all for, the de for any department, um, do recognize that, do, do encourage us to take different approaches to address these threats, absolutely. And I will also say not representing any department that I, and not speaking directly to the counterintelligence threat, but um, the innovation, the innovative spirit, the strength of the scientific and, and technolo technological base in the United States, and our cre creativity has, have long served us as a nation. And I think the future will require us to draw on that even more heavily. And I earnestly believe that in continually to, with great enthusiasm, draw on that creativity, we will continue to outpace China and remain in a position we need to be relative to Russia. I used to be a student at UNLV. My background was in geology, and I temporarily worked at the Yucca Mountain Project uh, in technical data management with TRW. My concern is when you talk about traditional proliferation detection capabilities, is that just human end? Is that what it is, strictly? Or are you looking at uh, contracts between countries and businesses that are supplying, like Mr. Hoxettler presented? Uh, raw materials, it would seem the most interesting thing is the most obvious source is when you have mining or engineering programs going on with different companies around the world, that would be the flag to follow immediately if they're looking for aluminum bauxite type of environments where you're going to be looking for radioactive materials. Do all the Western world share this information? I'm just curious. It seems like it'd be easy to find out whether or not somebody's moving ahead with a nuclear program simply by the materials they're looking for. And thank you. Absolutely. So I hope I'll, I'll, I'll I hope I hit everything that you're that you kind of alluded to there. So nuclear proliferation detection is a particular way that the United States addresses nuclear proliferation threats around the world that focuses on the use of technologies and science-enabled solutions to detect nuclear proliferation activities. And it is within the context of a interagency and whole of government set of strategies to, that all together are the United States approach to detect proliferation and to respond to proliferation threats. So 
these are science, th these are detect, these, excuse me, these are technologies. There are other approaches, like intelligence approaches, that, that pursue entirely different ways. And together, intelligence agencies take inputs from all sorts of different, lots of different capabilities across the US government, including nuclear proliferation detection. So when you mentioned humans, I just wanted to clarify that that is an intelligence function that belongs in a different lane. Um, but that this works in cooperation with input from something like human to inform national strategies or operations um, to interdict or deter or disrupt nuclear proliferation. Now, uh, to your point about different data sources, I think you know there are some really compelling ideas there. I'm smiling, smiling a little bit because uh, I'm sure you can also appreciate there are some significant data management uh, and data processing challenges, challenges with any sort of enterprise or whole of nation approach um, to data. And so the development of artificial intelligence technologies for proliferation detection comes along with developing more sophisticated approaches to data management, more sophisticated approaches to well, not always, but anyway, different approaches to data sharing. That's kind of the, the under the under the hood stuff that's happening in addition to, in addition to artificial intelligence. And that's lots of people, I mean, that's so not sexy when we talk about data management. Um, but the new algorithms that have been developed to support analyzing those sorts of data streams would enable us to finally go after, or to go after them with technology in a way that's not been possible before. So as uh, kind of a similarly mentioned earlier, um, we have maybe long hypothesized that there are important indicators and data sources like that, and that has been left to human analysts to be able to go after. AI enables you to go after the indicators and data sources like those text-based data files with technology. So then it happens automatically. Um, not, as simp not at all as simply as like a double click, and certainly requires this if the, the uh, requires development of a capability to, to enable that, but once developed, it becomes an automatic technology-based solution, which is part of why using artificial intelligence expands our capability in this way in such an impactful way. Uh, do they address concerns of rogue or rogue nations or terrorist organizations with um, somebody that we consider not exactly our friend in international relations of which we're seeing a very stressful situation in Eastern Europe right now, and the movement ahead of our own country having our adversary work on a treaty with an adversary, Iran, about nuclear development. And I'm kind of concerned that this seems like it flies in the face of reason. You're presenting something for us as a future to be concerned about. And yet we're like we're allowing our enemy literally to negotiate something that could be very deadly in the future for the planet. But anyway. Um, thank you for presenting. This is a really great presentation. Um, can you speak uh, to some specifics on how you might get sufficient uh, training data? for um, just the, I'm not sure what specific um, algorithms you're gonna use for this, but um, how are you gonna get sufficient train data? It just seems like um, like a difficult you know, problem. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And Alex, if you could go back just a couple of slides so we can have a pretty AI picture to look at while we talk about this. Back, back, back one more, yeah. One more, forward one more. Oh, other way. Uh, uh, this'll be fine. Or, okay, well, this will be fine. So there is an algorithm, a very, very popular algorithm right now within the class of artificial intelligence approaches called machine learning, which does rely on having what we call training data and a lot of training data. And by training data, we mean previous examples of the sort of thing that we're looking for, previous examples of what we want the AI to make a decision about. And it is a very strict requirement for the use of machine learning and most deep learning technologies that you have a lot of this labeled training data. And then there's this cool process where you show the AI algorithm all of this labeled data, you train it, 
and then you out, boop, boop, out pops this AI model that you can then deploy on other data sources and it will automatically recognize those same examples in new data sources, excuse me, new data elements that, elements that it, has, it has not yet seen before. And it's a very powerful approach and widely used for a lot of applications. But as very, very acutely pointed out, in national security, particularly in proliferation detection, we don't, thankfully, have a lot of previous examples. And certainly not on the scale that you would expect to use machine learning. And I have adopted an approach in the way that I think about AI for national security and nuclear proliferation detection that says very strictly, we do not have enough data to satisfy the standard use of machine learning and deep learning, and so we absolutely have to expect to develop new techniques um, to be able to use these algorithms for our applications. So anyone working in the AI for national security space, you just have to expect that you cannot use machine learning or deep learning the standard way, and you're gonna have to do something creative to be able to still leverage that power for our applications, and we absolutely still le should leverage that power. So there are some, an, a variety of ways to overcome that challenge, and where we are, sort of the state of AI for national security, is that we are exploring the development of those ways, and just now beginning to build out a sense for, given the nature of your problem, and the sort of data that you have available to you, what is the best approach to use to overcome that limitation when it comes to training data? And some approaches that we have used successfully is if you have a uh, reliable enough way to generate synthetic data using modeling and simulation, that is a promising way to overcome the limits of having enough training data. But, and, and people have made lots of progress in that space, but you're lucky if you have a model that works in that way. So some of the other ways that we have developed to address that concern, address not just what you do to, to, well, we have done things where you, okay, let me step back a second, say, a lot of times people are trying to pull bias out of AI algorithms, which we can also talk about. In these cases, we are trying to get additional information into the AI algorithm when we don't have enough data for it to learn it from the data. So we are finding a way to inject bias, inject information into the algorithm or bootstrap it with additional information that we know it will not learn from the data. So some ways to do that, you can, instead of, normally when you're using machine learning, you try to make your data as boring as possible. But in national security, when you make data boring, you lose all of the important information we know about these. So instead of making your data boring, we seek to make the data interesting. We intentionally design data source, data, training data sets to ensure that the algorithm learns what we want it to. And sometimes that's obvious stuff, like you want it to learn some thing is important kind of directly. And we've also developed techniques that come at it from a different angle. So for example, we have one problem where we want to develop an algorithm that can characterize some feature of interest in waveform data, it characterize a feature of interest in waveform data. But in nuclear proliferation detection, we are sometimes in a, what we call a cooperative environment, where somebody is very happy that you are there, looking at their facility and all that stuff, like a safeguards environment. And sometimes we're in an uncooperative environment where we don't have the benefit of knowing exactly where we are or in advance knowing exactly what that environment is going to look like. So we've worked on developing an algorithm that not just characterizes that feature of interest in the waveform, but can do that when it has never been in that environment before. And that has driven the development of an entirely different training paradigm than if we were just showing in examples of the waveform of interest. And in, and in that way, we've kind of done something even more creative than just the standard machine learning approach. And that is such a nice example of the sorts of advances in the science of AI that we drive working on such a hard problem like nuclear proliferation detection. And these techniques that we're talking about now can be applied broadly to medical imaging type applications or other applications in science, but you really have to be working on such a hard problem that drives the innovation to develop those new techniques or else you know, you'll just rely on collecting more data.
That's really cool. Um, it sounds like those are algorithms that would like primarily be developed like in you know a military or um, intelligence environment since like you know the private sector is pretty like data heavy with all their all their businesses. Um, <laughs> Can you name um, some other top areas of um, like national security that you think are going to most benefit from AI in the next like five years or so? Man, I should have been better prepared for that question. Ugh. So right now I have the opportunity to hear from senior decision makers across the entire Department of Defense and national security enterprise. And they, like I said, expect that AI is going to be there for them when they need it. Mm -hmm. And like I'm in the trenches with AI, and I'm like, guys, that gals, that AI is not quite here yet. But there's another important distinction in what they expect of AI, which is they expect the AI to change their decision making. And a lot of what we're doing with AI right now is kind of in that space that I described earlier, which is, you know, you have a world, like a nuclear proliferation world, and you find a way to represent it to your AI and data digital representation of the physical world, and then the AI helps you reason within that world differently in a way that enhances our ability to make insights about what we represent. But very few, there are very few examples of where somebody is also modeling decision making in a computational way. And for AI to, for AI to really change decision making, in the way that our senior leaders want it to, in the way that we really need to if we want to do decision making better. We also have to be modeling this decision space computationally. And the AI has to, and, and uh, the representation of the physical space has to somehow talk to the representation of the digital space for the AI to get into decision making. So right now a lot of, like a lot, the AI I just showed you where I'm saying we're better, better representing the threats of proliferation, I'm not modeling a decision maker yet. So it's, it, still is re, it still is relying on something coming out of the AI model and a human interpreting, interpreting it to make a decision. It's not getting into decision making. And like I said, our national security leaders expect some change in decision making. And I, I do see a squirrely face there, and, and I can, I, we can talk through some of that too. But just to say, to your question about what is next in terms of the science of AI, it would be in a responsible and appropriate way, representing some decision making computationally, so that the AI is also interacting with the physics of decision making. So it would like be going one to go one step further for this project it would be like after it's it has detected intent for proliferation um, to enhance decision making it would like recommend a couple of options to deter that proliferation is is that kind of what you're talking about i should also add that there is really such a far distance between even what i have described with getting into the decision space and even recommending a decision. What I mean by getting into the, the decision space is that there is a way that we, that we all think about how we make decisions. And that has to do with priorities around risk and like the physics of your decision. Are you considering how much time it takes to do something, how much money it takes to do something? So those are the dimensions of what we have to represent computationally for the AI to make to move into the decision space. That has nothing even to do with recommending decisions at that point or making decisions, um, but just characterizing the decision space. Again, think risk, quantifying risk, quantifying value um, in a way that is computational. That's still very, 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 very far from recommending decisions or acting on decisions. Very, very far. Thank you. Hi, I uh, have a real simplistic question. Uh -huh. uh, I don't. Did AI exist and algorithms exist before 9/11? And if they did, 24 hours before 9/11 happened, how would AI and algorithms have prevented that? 
what would have happened? Yeah. Who would have done what? Yeah. Just that's, real simplistic question. That is. And it. with uh, another question I yeah. also have is uh, uh, this thing with Putin. Um, how does AI and algorithms and all this technology, how, how does that affect his thinking? And what's going to stop him from utilizing nuclear weapons? Those are my questions. So as a field of science, artificial intelligence has existed uh, almost as long as computers. And we certainly saw the development of algorithms like, uh, and um, so particularly deep learning, which is the subset of the machine learning that we talked about, is a sort of algorithm designed to operate like the human brain, kind of like neurons firing. So um, that sort of research has been around for really decades, you know, 40, 50 years. But it is, as I mentioned, in that uh, sort of co-design advance with changes in computing and data that we've seen this explosion. So certainly it existed before 9-11. And I really just talked about machine learning and deep learning. There have been other algorithms like optimization and sem semantics and neuromorphic logic, you know, lots of other sorts of approaches that have certainly predated 9-11, but I think I, I certainly hear the, the spirit of your question, and we are motivated by things like 9-11 to, to, to move to a space where we are sharing information across the national security community much more seamlessly so that that information can come together in perhaps a computing-enabled or AI-enabled way that would should something like 9-11 happen again, we are in a position to have different information to inform different strategies for intervention. But it did exist before 9-11. Oh, not at all in the way that it does today. So what my question was, what would have happened had this algorithm and AI existed before 9-11, 24 hours? Would they have been able to stop? Certainly, we, there's and, and no possible way of knowing. Stop. I don't know, but we're all working very hard. So, you know, it certainly gives us new tools to be able to address the gravest security concerns like that. Angie, thanks for speaking. It's been uh, a pleasure. Can you talk through on the spectrum of kind of manual spreadsheets to magic AI, maybe in a crawl, walk, run mindset? Can you talk through where we're at? Like we're past automation, but how yeah. do you describe that spectrum of where we are progress-wise? Yeah, that's a very nice question. And there are a couple different ways to answer it. There are, well, and maybe let me answer it in a slightly different way. In a similar way to the way that the human perceives in a number of different senses, we are realizing advances in AI differently across different senses. And maybe to your comment about um, heavy investment in commercial and the differentiation and where we have really military specific applications. There is a lot of commercial industry around, well, I've mentioned a lot, images and text kind of related to you know seeing and hearing. And so our AI capabilities in those ways of observing and interacting with the world are very powerful and sophisticated. Though we always have to remember kind of another rule of thumb for understanding artificial intelligence is that the more generic the application and the more that you expect that there are lots of representations of what you're looking for in data, um, the better the capability will be. So generic tasks like finding animals in text or, or excuse me, in images or reading text, those are the most sophisticated parts of AI, most powerful AI capabilities. And like this is just totally Angie, I kind of think we're nearing something like artificial general intelligence in those ways of interacting with information, in images and with text. But when we move to other sorts of interacting, ways of interacting with the world, other data sources, a friend back there mentioned background in geology, there are lots of ways in data to kind of characterize geophysics or things like that. Um, AI for those sorts of data is far behind where we are with images and text for data. So that's one way to understand um, sort of the progress of artificial intelligence and where we are on the spectrum. And then again, the easier the task is to do, the farther we are with artificial intelligence. When you get to very 
highly scientific, highly technical tasks, we are farther behind because the part of what is artificial about artificial intelligence is not the intelligence. It's the computer part. So it still takes as much intelligence to make a very smart AI as it takes to kind of think about that concept generally. Um, so, so building AI for more sophisticated use cases um, is harder. And so we are behind in those techniques. Anyway, so that's kind of a short answer. That's an answer I could spend a lot of time on, but hopefully that provides a little bit of insight. Thank you again for presenting. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, the gentleman's questions about 9-11, uh, so forgive me if it sounds like that. Um, so far as I know, our intelligence agencies learned about India's first nuclear test almost from a newspaper headline. Um, and to your comment about wanting to change how we make decisions, I'm sure these intelligence failures are where our government wants to uh, focus the most on improving their decision-making strategies. So counter to almost uh, the uh, um, ethic of, of big data, how would you zero in on, on, on improving, particularly in these areas where we've seen the, the biggest failures, how do you zero in on those and is that much of a concern? Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah, I certainly won't speak to specific threats or the specific case of India, um, but will speak to the way, our, the way you go about developing artificial intelligence because it is still, and I could talk about uh, sort of what my professional opinion is on this, this concept, but artificial intelligence has a very narrow the way that we build AI right now has a very narrow sense of intelligence. It can only do a very specific set of things, and that's a very small and specific set of things that you um, intentionally design it to do. So I do think, I, I mean, it is my approach that in developing artificial intelligence for nuclear proliferation detection or other national security applications, we, you have to develop AI with a particular hypothesis in mind, with a particular use and application in mind. I'll also share that um, when you have an AI that you have built to do something, um, like uh, I have the example of looking for scientists engaging in interesting research, it can do that one thing. And when we think about reusing artificial intelligence, it's possible to reuse artificial intelligence for other tasks, but that science is very immature. And the more different the task is for which you're trying to reuse the AI, the less predictable it is that it's going to perform. So perhaps developing an AI um, to find scientists engaging in interesting research uh, related to nuclear, science and technology, and then scooching it to another scientific discipline, that's a pretty close match. So perhaps we expect to be able to reuse that AI tool for that close next task, but asking it to, you know, read Plato is a, you know, completely different application. So AI in that way is very different, and the nuclear nonproliferation field has traditionally been uh, uh, sort of staffed, we draw on the expertise, of, of physical scientists and people who understand building solutions in an engineering way where you seek to develop, to identify first principles, so kind of building blocks of existence and add on those things and those first, first principles, laws of gravity type things are really universally transferable. Everything obeys the laws of gravity. Artificial intelligence at this stage in development is not that way. When you build an AI, there's no kind of fundamental principle that you've discovered in your AI solution. It is a solution that is very local to that data and to that question, that task that you're asking the AI to do. And, and lots of people might say something about moving the AI to a different application, but like buyer beware, you know, proceed with caution. It, that is an immature capability for the science, one that I am eagerly kind of participating in advancing our science in that way, but that's really not how AI works. And so it requires 
uh, an, entire, an entire mindset shift in our approach to developing technologies for these applications because we're used to you know, looking for some law of physics or some undeniable chemical reaction that happens everywhere in a particular way. And AI isn't necessarily that same sort of engineering or technological solution. We have time for one more question for Ms. Sheffield. Um, do your research findings get published in a format that the general public can read? Absolutely. So the, like the research that I've mentioned on these slides, and um, you could kind of Google it. We can go back through those slides, too, to show you. But the national laboratories, as appropriate, are prolific in these sorts of publications. And also, um, now, and, and this is, you know, AI is an emerging field. So we are only now beginning to articulate the sorts of science questions around AI for national security and nuclear proliferation detection. But now, you know, even you have some ideas for what to look for now. You know, AI around very data sparse conditions, AI around data for sensors and measurement technologies, things of that nature are, if you were to search for publications that are relevant in this way, um, those, that, those would be like search terms to look for. So, you know, and whenever you see kind of some generic AI research, double check if it's images, um, and that will also help you understand if they're kind of doing what we're doing here. But generally, yes, the national laboratories especially, and also our partners in academia where possible, publish as much as they can to advance the entire field. Thank you. Can you show me that, that one slide that you were talking about that had like the mm -hmm. publication on it? Oh, Alex, would you go back? Thanks. Or I, and I can, we can also chat afterwards. I'm going to stick around. And also, um, if, you, if you Google, you go to war with the data you have. That is an essay that I've written on this that also has a lot of links to some relevant publications in this. So that's a good starting point. You go to war with the data you have. Which slide was, slide was it? Oh, it's OK. We found another solution. Thank you, Ms. Sheffield, for such an amazing presentation and for providing us with such insight into the current and future role that AI plays in nuclear nonproliferation and beyond. And thank you, everybody watching remotely or here in person for joining us today. We are going to be having a meet and greet uh, with Ms. Sheffield after this. Um, so if you do have additional questions, um, she'd be more than happy to chat with you after. Thank you so much, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much. Recording stopped.